Welcome everyone to another iTest webinar. This one is called A Beautiful Mind and Soul. And it's about a book by Dr. Gerard Vershuren. And uh, our key respondent today is Dr. Stephen Barr, president of the um, Society of Catholic Scientists. Uh, my name is Tom Sheehan and I'm the Emeritus Director of iTest. Let me tell you a little about iTest. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, I-T-E-S-T, -E is an association of theologians, scientists, and others who are committed to a Catholic viewpoint about science and how it relates to our faith. iTest explores the theological uh, traditions and the what we call the wisdom traditions of the human community, and we do so in the light of science. Um, our mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic viewpoint that science and faith are compatible and correspondingly parallel paths to an understanding of God and a greater human fulfillment. Before I introduce our presenters, um, sister Carla May Streeter, a Dominican sister um, uh, who is a professor emeritus at the Aquinas Institute of Theology, going to lead us in our opening prayer. Sister Carla May. Most kind God, you are the fullness of truth, the fullness of goodness, and the fullness of beauty. Captivate us by the beauty we see in this season of your risen son in his transformed humanity. Grant us the faith and the staying power to hang on to you in this troubled time with the promise you give us of our own transformation in beauty, in goodness, and in truth. We ask your blessing on our presenters and your blessing on me so that we have ears to hear and a heart to be moved. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carla May. Uh, at this point, I'm going to introduce Dr. Stephen Barr, who many of you already know as the president of the Society of Catholic Scientists. Dr. Barr has been uh, the president of the, well, not only president of the Society of Catholic Scientists, but he's also a professor, although emeritus now, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Delaware. And he was the director of the Bartol Research Institute there. Dr. Barr received his PhD in physics in 1978 from Princeton University. He does research in theoretical particle physics, especially grand unified theories, theories of CP violation, neutrino oscillations, and particle cosmology. Dr. Barr is a fellow of the American Physical Society and is the author of the very excellent, wonderful book, which you all should have read by now, entitled Modern Physics and Ancient Faith. Steve, it's, you take it over. Okay, thanks, Tom. So I am responding. So we're doing this uh, in a somewhat um, reversed order. So I'm giving a response before the actual main presentation, which we hope to hear from uh, Jerry Vershuren. I, I, uh, I should call him, I suppose, Dr. Vishuran, but I know him and have had, I, I don't think I've met face uh, in person, but we've had many uh, discussions by email over the years. So I, I'm going to refer to him as Jerry, if people don't mind. It, it, it's it's uh, easier to say that. Uh, so there's much in um, Jerry's book, um, A Beautiful Mind. I think it's called A Beautiful Mind and Soul. There's much in the book that... Uh, one could discuss. Um, there's a, just a lot of interesting content. 
And, um, and one could talk about it for days, but I only have, well, 10 minutes. And maybe if I have to stretch it out, I, I, but even if I only have uh, 20 or 30 minutes, um, I'm going to have to just pick out a few somewhat random points to, to discuss. One of the things I like about Jerry's books, uh, he's written quite a few of them on science and faith, is that they're full of wonderful quotes um, from eminent scientists and philosophers that I'd never seen before, the quotes I'd never seen before, and that he deploys with great effect uh, to support his positions and to uh, uh, illustrate the errors that he's attacking. And uh, these alone are worth the price of admission. Um, at, at some point, I'd like to sit down with a stack of Jerry's books and just cull out um, from them all of these uh, marvelous quotes that, he's, uh, that he has and to use them in my own talks and articles. Uh, now, as far as the substance of the book, uh, the, the, his book is um, basically the main themes of his book are uh, scientific, uh, scientistic reductionism scientism, and on the one hand, and uh, a defense of the reality of the human spiritual soul, on the other hand. He de he's de the book is about the soul and defending the reality of the spiritual soul against materialist reductionism. Now, uh, I am in fundamental agreement with uh, the main positions uh, that being defended in his book. And, um, and in fact, I agree with almost all of his analyses and arguments. Um, there are a few things in the book on which I see things differently. And I wish you were here right now because then maybe that would provoke a discussion later. Uh, but they have to do with matters that are not central to the book. For example, I'm not convinced that science um, uh, could not have arisen uh, except within the matrix of a Christian or at least theistic culture. Uh, that's a point that uh, uh, Stanley Yockey makes and, and uh, Jerry makes it in his book that, that, that Christianity was a necessary precondition for the rise and development of modern science. And I, I'm skeptical. It's certainly is conducive, uh, the Christian belief is conducive to the pursuit of science and it did play a positive role and contributed to the rise and development of science. Whether, whether you know, hypothetically it is a necessary condition, I, I, I'm not convinced. Um, I think science could see, conceivably could have developed in the absence of Christianity. So, but that's a, a relatively minor point in the book. Uh, another thing that um, I would probably disagree with uh, Jerry on is uh, that I don't think uh, that science, modern science, relies on religious ideas for its fundamental assumptions. He, he makes that claim in the book that even today, um, the science continues to rely on Christian ideas uh, to justify its fundamental assumptions. And I'm not sure that that's true. For example, uh, it's, um, it, what, among the fundamental assumptions of modern science, which Jerry mentions, are uh, the, 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 that the world is orderly and also that it's comprehensible. Now, it is certainly true that we believe as Christians that the reason the world is orderly and comprehensible is that it was the product of divine reason that God uh, created it. Uh, but I think in the order of human knowledge, things go in the other direction. That is, I think we first know, in most cases, we first know that the world is orderly and comprehensible by seeing that order and by actually understanding things about the world. And it, from that, which we know first, that it's orderly and comprehensible, we argue to the existence of God. And so I think the things are in the other at the level of causation, it's God causes the order and, and, and intelligibility of the world. But at the level of our knowledge, we first know that the world is orderly and intelligible, and we reason from that to the existence of God. But anyway, again, these are not fundamental. Uh, these are somewhat off the main stream of his book. Of his, uh... So let me talk to, um, uh, let, me, let me discuss the main uh, topics of his book. Uh, 
And as they say, when it comes to the main themes of reductionism and the reality of the human spiritual soul, I'm in wholehearted agreement with virtually everything he says in the book. So let me just pick one, one or two things that I particularly appreciate, since I can't discuss everything. Uh, one thing I particularly appreciate in this book is that Jerry correctly diagnoses the causes of scientism and reductionism. Being a scientist himself, he understands where the boundary between science itself and scientism really lies. And he also understands the difference between reduction as used in modern science, which is not a bad thing in general, and reductionism. He understands the distinction and explains it very well. Uh, and these are things that some Catholic writers and other religious writers sometimes get wrong. Some authors take aim at scientism and they end up hitting science. So consider reductionism. There are some authors who think that the approach that characterizes much of modern science of understanding physical objects and systems by analyzing them in terms of their constituent parts inevitably yields a distorted picture of reality. They repeat the well-known aphorism that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And they believe that modern science does reduce things just to the sums of their parts and is therefore inherently a reductionistic enterprise in the bad sense. And so they actually attack science itself and its methods as yielding a false picture, of a distorted picture. Now, this is not true. And Jerry explains in his, this, in his book very well. I want to quote directly from a passage that I particularly like, where he uh, is a customarily lucid passage in his book. So, quote, and there's some ellipses. I am cutting out some text in the middle, but... Quote, there has been quite some confusion on this issue. On the one hand, there seems to be something hidden in the whole that the parts do not have. On the other hand, we do not know what that something would be. The answer to the problem can be found in the distinction between substances, properties, and relationships, which you had discussed pretty earlier. The question of how we should take this more beyond uh, more, when you say the whole is more than the sum of its parts, the question of how, is how we should take this more that is considered to be hidden. If we take it as another substance with properties, we get into trouble. That happened, for example, when some life scientists in the past um, uh, introduced a mysterious substance the so-called life force to explain why living things are alive. What these people did not realize is that the parts of the whole of a whole also have a certain relationship to each other. Taking the whole apart destroys what we had before by breaking the relationships between the parts. So what Jerry is saying here is that one is only left with a sum of parts, or let's say just a set of parts, if one ignores all the relationships among the parts in the whole. And science is not guilty of this. Only someone who does not really understand how modern science operates thinks that science does do this. Science analyzes, modern science analyzes things in terms of their constituent parts and their relationships to each other in the, within the whole. And that is entirely proper. And rather than distorting reality, it is generally necessary to understanding reality correctly. That proper kind of reduction, which is done within science, 
is not the culprit in, in, in producing the bad kind of reductionism. As Jerry explains, the real mistake that leads to reductionism is a taking a further step which goes beyond science of saying that the parts and their relationships in the whole are all there is there to the whole. There is nothing but those parts and their relationships. Nothing but. And as he quotes, people often talk about nothing buttery. Now, I don't know. I wish he were here so he could uh, agree or disagree. With us. So consider, for example, now to say that there's nothing but, uh, when talking about some object or system, that there's nothing but the parts and their relationships within the whole is sometimes valid and sometimes is not valid. It's not always bad. Sometimes it's okay. So uh, it, my own view is if we're talking about an inanimate object, like a lump of coal or a piece of copper or a glass of water, uh, I would say that talking about the parts, the atoms and so forth, and their relationships among each other. Actually, I think there's nothing wrong personally, or I, I, I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong with saying there's nothing, nothing more to the glass of water or the lump of coal, nothing but the constituent parts and their relationships. One could debate that. I, I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong in that case with nothing buttery. But when it comes to say a cat or a dog, I would say, and, I, and Jerry I know would agree with this, to say there's nothing to a dog beyond the parts, the constituent parts and their relationships to each other, the, the physical constituents and their physical relationships, that is uh, reductionistic and, and wrong. Because for example, the dog has consciousness. And I would argue, and I suspect Jerry would agree, that consciousness cannot be understood simply by an analysis of these atoms and their, and their interactions and relationships. There's something more there. Um, and, and, and to uh, say nothing but uh, the parts in their relationships is, is, uh, is reductionistic and wrong. So anyway, um, so I, I, I really appreciate that part of his book because, as I said, a lot of writers uh, falsely mistake. Uh, they mistake the, the proper reduction that goes on in the physical sciences, which is, which is uh, with reductionism. Uh, so let me use an analogy that's not in Jerry's book uh, to, to those who, who still might be uh, uh, worried about reduction uh, and analyzing things into their parts. Suppose we were talking about understanding a passage of uh, a piece of te uh, text. Uh, uh, well, there's no way to understand it properly without, so that the text is made up of paragraphs, which are made up of sentences, which are made up of letters. Those are the parts. Now it's true that if one just had, the, that the text is more than the sum of those parts. If we just had, you know, fragmented the text into its constituent words and, and just sort of wrote all here, listed, gave an, an inventory of the words of the text, breaking the relationships among them and just fragmenting them into the constituent parts, then you have nothing, they, they don't have a text anymore. You don't, it, to understand the text, you have to understand the words, indeed, and their relationships. And so you have to understand how the words are arranged and fit together uh, according to the rules of syntax and grammar. You have to understand the role of prepositions and conjunctions and relative pronouns and subordinate clauses and prepositional phrases and all that kind of thing. You have to understand the structure and how the parts relate to each other within the sentence and how the sentences are related to other sentences and so on. 
That's the reduction that science does, analogous to the reduction. You, you look at the parts and their relationships to understand the whole. And it would be madness to say that you could understand the text in any other way. You, that's a necessary thing. I mean, uh, I think all of us who have written articles are sometimes amazed that we have letters to the editor or emails addressed to us personally, reacting to things we've written, which show that the person does has no, completely misinterpreted what we said. And, and often it's clear they did it because they were sort of just had some gestalt, you know, holistic view of what we wrote, but did not pay close attention to the parts of the sentences and how they, the, the, the detailed structure of the sentences. They, you, have to, you have to do that kind of reduction in order to understand things. Um, so, uh, it's, and so I think that's a clear case of this. There's nothing wrong with, 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 with analyzing holes in terms of their parts and their relationships. Now, the, the, the example of a text also shows uh, where you can have um, reductionism uh, because there's more to the text. The text is an example of where there's more to it than just the constituent words and their grammatical and syntactical relationship. Because you could take Google Translate or some other program and it could read a passage. I often take a passage, say, of French. I don't know any French at all. So I, if I, there's a passage in, some, in French, I will copy and paste it into Google Translate, and it will produce, amazingly enough, a well-written grammatical English translation of it. And it can do that, and the only way it can do that is because it knows the words, it, 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 underst it understands, in quotes, the words and their syntactical and grammatical relationships. It, it knows how English sentences are constructed and how French sentences are constructed. And it knows how the words, uh, the, how the parts in English are uh, related to the parts in French and how the, and so on. And it can, but what doesn't the Google Translate know? It doesn't have any idea of the meanings of the text. It can translate, but it has no idea of the meaning. It doesn't understand the French text any more than I do. And that's because there's a layer, a, a, a level that goes beyond the mere parts and their grammatical and syntactical relationships. There's the semantic level, the level of meaning. And so there's an example is if somebody were to say, there's nothing to this text other than the words and their grammatical and syntactical relationships, uh, they, that would be nothing buttery. And uh, it would be wrong. It'd be overlooking the higher level of under, uh, which is given to us by meaning. And, um, and so um, anyway, so I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate that reduction is necessary in many cases, but it's sometimes inadequate. And so the rest of his book um, is talking, of, is defending the idea that there's more to human beings uh, than physics and biology and chemistry can explain more to us than atoms related to each other and interacting in certain ways. And, and in particular, we have a spiritual soul. Uh, and there's aspects of his discussion of that, which I also appreciate. Um, um, but I maybe I, I, I should stop here. Um, there is a, um, uh, a mathematical principle that we all know that when you multiply something by zero, then you've got the answer is zero and you can't get it back. You can't put back things that you have taken out when you multiplied by zero. Well, let's look at a simple uh, example here. Suppose you've got this huge string of ones and zeros. It goes clear across the room and out the door and keeps on going. And you say, well, that's pretty meaningless. And I say to you, no, 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 it isn't meaningless. That's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony as played by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And here's the CD in my hand that has all the little dots and dents on there, which correspond to those ones and zeros. And that's why I know this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And it isn't just a bunch of ones and zeros. You say, well, prove it to me. So what do I do? I come along and I put it in a CD and I play it. Well, I have just put in a whole bunch of interpretive factors, 
factors at a higher level, new dimensions perhaps, in which you've got the cultural level of being able to tell the difference between this orchestra and maybe the Cleveland or New York orchestra. I know something about Beethoven. I know this, I know that. There's all these factors. And then you start taking these away. And you pretty soon, you reduced yourself again and again. You take away the CD player. You take away the electricity uh, that comes in from the wall at 115 volts. You take away this, that, and the other, and pretty soon you're down to nothing. And you say, ha, I've reduced it to just a bunch of ones and zeros. How foolish is that? You have to understand that you cannot reduce reality to just the very simple parts and say that's all there is. And I think that's an important lesson that everybody needs to examine in their own lives to look at a case where they have perhaps reduced something too much and having done so have lost the reality that is really there. Are there questions from the audience? We, we do have a question from Gary. How do you think the work of Wolfgang Smith, theistic evolution, the quantum enigma, et cetera, fits in with today's topic? Uh, okay, so that's more for me than for Jerry, because um, yeah, I, don't, I'm not, I don't remember Jerry mentioning Wolfgang Smith. I read Wolfgang. Wolfgang Smith is a physicist. He's probably quite elderly by now. Um, he is, uh, wrote a book quite a long time ago called The Quantum Enigma. And there's another book with the same title, actually, called The Quantum Enigma, but it's a completely different kind of a book. Um, so, so Wolfgang Smith uh, is a Catholic, and I read his book, and I, to be honest, I don't think he, I didn't find that it really came to grips with or resolved um, the deep philosophical questions raised by quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics, as everybody knows, is kind of strange. And, it, and there's been a lot of debate for about 100 years now, almost 100 years, of what its philosophical implications are. And a lot depends on um, how you interpret it. Um, and what, um, and I, don't, I, don't, I didn't find in his book a satisfactory resolution of those questions to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm not, I can't, re I read it such a long time ago that I can't give a detailed criticism of it. Uh, I don't know that I uh, could point to something uh, that, 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 that I would regard as wrong. I just don't think he, I, was re I read it with the hopes that he would say, ah, here's the right way to understand quantum mechanics and here's the philosophical view of the world that it tends to lead us to, and I, I didn't find that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were speaking, uh, Dr. Barr, um, you brought to mind the principle of irreducible complexity. So I'm wondering, um, how does that play into this process of reduction? Is there, uh, without, uh, at a certain point, you hit that, um, that principle of irreducible complexity, and you can't reduce further. Uh, do reductionists reduce further? Is that their, uh, is that their failing? I, I, I think there. Uh, I, I think that's a that's actually somewhat a logically distinct set of questions. And the and the reducible you the word reducible in the irreducible complexity, or uh, debate, is not being used in the same way as reducible in uh, in this current context of, of what Jerry's talking about. Uh, so reductionism, in, in in the sense that we all most of us I think here deplore. Um, is the idea is, is reducing some higher reality like um, human being to something a, a lower to we're nothing but a bunch of atoms you know mm -hmm. Carl Sagan famously wrote I am I am a collection of water calcium and organic molecules called Carl Sagan okay that's that's hardcore reductionist I am nothing but a bunch of molecules Okay. That's reductionism. Um, irreducible complexity, what they're talking about, they're, the people who talk about that, particularly Mike Behe, what they're making the claim is that certain structures that arise in biology uh, are so complex 
uh, and they point to the bacterial flagellum and the blood clotting system and various other things are such so complex in their structure that they could not have arisen in a gradual step-by-step -step way uh, uh, through uh, Darwinian mechanisms, uh, Darwinian evolution. And the idea there is that if you have the irreducible complexity, what they mean is something where you need the entire structure, all the parts to be in place, or it doesn't function at all. And so the idea, they, their claim is you couldn't have built up these structures step by step through evolution, because until you have all the parts there, it doesn't give you any survival value. It has no, it, does, it doesn't work at all. So you had to not build it up step by step, but you had to somehow get all the parts together all in one fell swoop, which they claim is uh, virtually impossible. So, and that's a whole debate. I, I'm not persuaded that one can so easily identify things that are truly irreducibly complex in that way, but that's a, a whole different kind of debate. It's an anti-evolution argument. Are there other questions from the group? Thank you, uh, Dr. Barr. We have one from uh, Richard Wilbur. The more than parts is, uh, seems in many cases as a level of teleology of meaning. Uh, Roger Scruton, for example, mentions the use of architectural materials that are reducible to very different substances, but which, for example, serve for a human, the exact same decorative purpose, say in constructing a stone mantelpiece. Uh, Richard, is there a question um, uh, that follows your comment? Uh, well, I, I actually hit send before I finished. Um, it seems that, that you know, I'll, analogous to Scruton's point about um, d entirely different substances having in a sense, the same meaning and purpose for people. Uh, you know, the, the reductionist goes way beyond the reality of what we see in meaning. Uh, John Haldane made the same point once when he said, uh, how do you look at the hill in Southern Indiana? Uh, there is, you know, nothing in its uh, geology that describes it as a hill we people describe it as a hill and there and sometimes say it's really quite beautiful and picturesque um so there's much of what uh we're trying to to retain and capture <clears throat> it you know i think is is we need to keep the focus of what we bring to it uh and um what you know, and consequently, the intelligibility of it within a, within a system of our meaning. I don't know. Well, you know, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, Jerry's book is written in the form of a dialogue, like a platonic dialogue. And he has the two characters are himself, I guess, and a skeptical, uh, 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 a skeptical scientist, uh, uh, one who is a reductionist, basically. I've always found dialogues as a, you know, the thing is there's a temptation if you write a dialogue and, and you have a character in it that's taking the opposite position of yours is to, of course, you're in control of your opponent there. <laughs> and the thing is, I don't know, you know, the question is, 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 the, uh, is the game rigged, you know? And so I, I am, as I'm reading Jerry's book, I'm sometimes tempted to come up with arguments that I think are better than the ones that his hypothetical uh, reductionist materialist character is coming up with. You know, I, I, I'm a contrarian and I'm sort of argumentative and, uh, and uh, I, I always, you know, well, on the other hand, you know, you could say this, um, he does a fairly, he's pretty fair. That is, he does, you know, he, his, um, his reductionist, um, a punching bag. <laughs> no, his reductionist character is not just a, a patsy who uh, is there as a prop. He is, is raising serious points in the book. If I were a reductionist, a hardcore materialist, I would say, I would say, well, you know, we look at the hill as beautiful, or we regard this piece of music as having some meaning to us or being beautiful. And I would give that an evolutionary explanation. You know, um, they would say, uh, um, 
you know, you might say, well, some of these people like Dawkins would say, we find certain landscapes beautiful because they remind us, because it's hardwired into us by evolution to, to be positively, uh, to feel at home in or to be attracted to the kinds of environments in which the human species first arose. The, the savannas of uh, Eastern Africa. Uh, that's the environment in which we arose, which we, to which we became adapted. And so those environments are pleasant to us, um, congenial to us. And so, you know, you could, or, uh, so you, you can always find, you know, if you look at the whole, uh, they, they would reduce all this human meaning to ultimately to, to sociology and psychology and so forth, and ultimately to neurons firing and those kinds of things. So, I mean, they would have an answer to that. Um, uh, and so, I, I, I mean, I just want to say that, that you know, I, I don't think I'll find their answers ultimately satisfying. And, and Jerry, I think, does a pretty good job of uh, critiquing their mm -hmm. answers. But. Um, well, returning the... Um it seems to me that there's a, a distinction between all those things made out of atoms and molecules and the soul. Yes. Uh, Father Spitzer has written very extensively on the fact that the soul is different. It survives beyond bodily death and so forth. And his material is, is quite interesting. Um, but when I think of the intelligence to be able to interpret my example before was music, but the other examples are equally valid. These are properties of the soul that are lost when you try to reduce to atoms and molecules. And I think that's the mistake reductionists make, is that they um, reach back all the way they can to the uh, molecules and all this, and they go all the way down to quarks and so forth, if they could. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the important stuff that has to do with the soul has been lost as they step downward. Right, and, and and the book is largely, I mean, about the soul. I didn't talk about that in my little my little reaction to the book, but the book, his, Jerry's book is largely about defending the idea of the spiritual soul. One of the things I like about his book, about at least uh, some discussion of the soul, when you read some Catholic authors discussing the soul, they are fixated on the idea of the Aristotelian idea of the soul. And I'm not, I'm not questioning the validity of this idea. I, I agree with it. Uh, but they, they give more importance, I think, than necessary uh, to the idea of the soul as the form of the body. And so they say this, the soul, human soul is related to the body as form is to matter. And that's a very important insight from Aristotle but it doesn't go far enough. And Jerry understands that that doesn't go far enough. Um, and, and the reason some people put such stress on that and on hylomorphism, the, the relation of matter and form, is that they're dealing with a set of issues, a certain set of issues that arise, for example, in bioethics or in uh, uh, having to do with, uh, well, often arising from bioethical questions. And that's their focus. But there's the, the another set of questions, and, and they're the big enemy, is uh, that they're opposing is dualism. The boogeyman there is, a, is a, some kind of dualism. And what their concern is to oppose, is to, is to answer the dualist by saying that, you know, a human being is a psychophysical unity. We're not, as the catechism says, we're not just a body and a soul as separate entities or substances that are kind of attached to each other. We are one, a human being is a one, is one person with a body and a soul, which are unified psychophysical unity. And that's their concern is to oppose dualism. But I think the, in many ways in our time, uh, at, at least as big a threat the danger is posed by materialist monism. Yes, dualism is bad. There are certain kinds of dualism are bad, 
But a certain kinds of monism are bad. That is saying that we're nothing but matter. That's actually the big threat. I mean, the scientific atheists or the people that we're worried about, <laughs> I think most of us here, we're trying to counteract the scientific atheists and materialists. They're not dualists. Using the weapons that are good to defeat dualism is not effective in defeating the materialists. And the problem is if all you talk about is the soul as the form of the body, you aren't getting anywhere against the materialists because Aristotle said, and uh, St. Thomas would have said, the plants have souls, vegetative souls, animals, non-rational animals have souls, sen sensitive souls. And in the case of plants and non-rational animals, their souls are the forms of their bodies. And actually the most hard-bitten atheist and materialist could agree with that. If you explain to a Richard Dawkins or a Daniel Dennett what is meant by, you know, say, what we mean by the soul of a plant is the form of its body or the animal, they would say, okay, in that sense, I agree that plants have souls and animals have souls. And furthermore, Aristotle said, would have said, I think, that when the body of the plant or the animal dissolves, disintegrates, the soul goes with it. The animal and plant souls are not immortal. They go, they, when the matter is gone, the form goes with it. Or the, um, and, our, and so, and the atheist says that too. Now the real issue when you're dealing with the materialists and the, atheist, the hardcore materialists is to, what, what's important there is not that we have souls, which are the forms of our bodies. That's not the crucial point. The crucial point is that our souls are spiritual souls. And that there's something about our souls that is quite different from the souls of plants and animals. And that we have in particular the spiritual faculties of reason and free will that transcend the merely material. There is no physical organ. There's no bodily organ for free will, for freedom or rationality, according to St. Thomas and according to Catholic tradition and so um, that's the critical thing, is to defend the spirituality of the human soul and the fact that it is not dependent on matter to the same, in the same way that the souls of animals are. And that, I think, is something that sometimes, it's because when some Catholic writers, because they're locked in battles with dualism and they're focused on the dualist threat, and trying to emphasize the unity of the person by this idea of hylomorphism. That's all well and good, but it doesn't address what in our context of dealing with atheists and materialism are the more important points. And I think Jerry understands this. And a lot of his book, he doesn't get bogged down in a lot of Aristotelian discussions of form and matter and hylomorphism. He, 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 he gets to the really the heart of it, which is showing that the spiritual powers of human beings are not intelligent, understandable in material terms. Um, and I think that's a, a strength of his, of his book. Um, and in one, one discussion with I thought was very loose, he's a very lucid writer. He's talking about uh, the fact that we can deal, human beings deal with propositions. We, we can understand propositions and we can rationally affirm or deny them. Those aren't physical acts. A proposition is not made of matter. It's not a material entity. When you grasp the meaning of a proposition, you're not, that's not a physical act. It can't be understood by analyzing the motions of the molecules and the atoms and the electrons and so on in your brain. And when you affirm a proposition, that's not a physical act. And, um, and, and, and you can't, and that cannot be reduced to uh, material, uh, understood in materialist terms. And I, I think that's a powerful part of this book. Okay, uh, this is Chick Collard in Los Alamos. I know Steve, we- Yes, I know Chick. Hi, Chick. How are you, how you doing? Uh, I have a, an interesting question. Uh, in evolution, we keep moving from uh, uh, we keep moving from uh, uh, animal to human beings. So sometime in Homo sapiens, 
uh, we must have gotten a soul, a spiritual soul, because those other animals didn't have souls. Uh, when did that happen? Well, nobody knows. Um, I, I think um, it happened whenever freedom and rationality appeared. Okay, that's what Ratzinger said. Yes. And so I have a question. Uh, before that, uh, with maybe Neanderthals, since they don't have spiritual souls, is it okay to kill them? Well, uh, well actually, we don't know about Neanderthals, whether they had ra reason and free will. That's a very interesting question. Well, go back to Homo erectus. Okay, go back to Homo erectus or, you know, uh, Australopithecus. Yeah, well, yeah. it depends on what you think about the morality of killing non-rational animals. I personally regard it if one were to kill a dog. I'm a dog lover myself. If, yeah, one, yeah. if one were to wantonly kill a dog or even inflict unnecessary suffering on it, uh, that's, I think, a very bad thing. And um, is it Well, if the, dog, if the dog was uh, doing something which uh, was not good... Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think it's murder... Uh, I mean, the traditional Christian view, I don't know, that, uh -huh. I don't know there's a doctrine on this, but uh, I don't, that, because Christianity doesn't say much about animals. Uh, it's mostly focused on God and human beings and our relationship to God and so on, and it doesn't have much to say. But I think the mainstream of Christian thought is that, anim I don't know that you'd be a heretic if you saw the dolphins had spiritual souls. I mean, uh, I don't know that would make you formally a heretic or anything. But anyway, uh, but I think the mainstream of Christian belief is that only humans of terrestrial creatures, anyway, have spiritual souls, and only uh, and it would be murder to kill um, uh, to to, to uh, directly and intentionally kill an innocent human being. Uh, whereas it might be an awful thing to kill uh, an animal, but it wouldn't be murder. Okay, let's carry that one step farther. There would be murder to kill an, uh, an extraterrestrial who had reason and free will. That would be. Yeah, true. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's carry that one step farther. Uh, yeah. As a fetus develops, you know, phylogeny re recapitulates ontology. Uh, when does the fetus get its soul? There's no, actually, the Catholic Church is not of a definitive position on that. Um, and that's a whole complex question. But uh, there are some, you know, historically, the mainstream view was, uh, until actually relatively recently, in the Catholic, among Catholic theologians, until maybe, I don't know, the 19th century, perhaps, was that it was sometime, it wasn't at conception, but it was sometimes later. And the reason for that had to do with the idea that you couldn't have a rational soul unless there was what the medievals would call apt matter, materia apta, which in modern terms, they didn't know it at that time about neuroscience and neur neurons or anything. But in modern terms, it would be unless you had the physical substrate, which might be at some certain neur neurological structure that was capable of uh, being the basis of, of certain kinds of rational activity. And so that they, there was the idea that the, the spiritual soul did not appear until some point after conception. This, the, the, the dominant view among theologians today, which I think I share, is that the spiritual soul appears at conception, but it's not a matter of definitive church teaching. But I don't think that's relevant to the question of the morality of abortion. It never has been, because even in the Middle Ages, when most theologians, I think, regarded the spiritual soul as appearing at, a, at some point, intermediate stage during pregnancy, it was regarded as homicide, it was regarded as a mortal sin, and as morally equivalent to uh, homicide, to, to, uh, to, have, uh, to kill the unborn child at any stage of gestation. Um, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense, because when you ask yourself, what are you killing when you kill a person? What are you, what are you taking from a person when you kill him? You're not taking away the past that's already over and done with. It's water over the bridge or over the dam or whatever. Water over the dam. You're not taking away the present. You're taking away the future life. So let me give you a thought experiment, like a Sophie's choice. Suppose some Nazis came to you and said, you know, there's this guy we're going to kill. 
doing? And I'm going to give you the choice. Do we kill him at the age of five? He's a five-year-old child. We're going to kill him now. And we're going to kill him... Uh, or we're going to wait till he's 65 and kill him then. And it's up to you. Do we kill him at five or kill him at 65? Well, I think all else being equal, you say, let him live to be 65. Because if you kill him at five, you've just you've taken away 60 years of his life. That you've destroyed his 60 years that you wouldn't have destroyed if you kill him at 65. Now, what you're destroying is the future that of that person, the, the, the earthly future of that person. And when you, by, um, and so by that logic, if you kill someone in utero, you're taking away more from that person. Even if you, even if hypothetically that unborn child has not yet a spiritual soul, that's even worse in a sense, because you've not only taken away some of his earthly life, if you kill the unborn child before it is ensouled, you've actually prevented that soul from coming into being <laughs> and thus you've deprived that child of its eternity and so i think it's worse so i think that the, the premise of your question is that uh, it's only bad if it's you're killing something that already has a spiritual soul i think that is a flawed idea well colleagues um i have to uh, jump in here and say that we have pretty much exhausted our time and come to the end of the hour um, uh, Sebastian, do you have any more uh, particular uh, questions that can be fit in, or is it time to wrap things up? Tom, thank you for serving as the moderator of this webinar. And with that, uh, we can move to Father Vincent Uke's closing prayer. Holy Trinity, we thank you for our Catholic faith and its role in developing natural sciences. Help us to appreciate what you have made for us. Help us to, to appreciate the relationships of the totality of creation, both physical, conscious, reflective conscious, and spiritual. May the grace of our understanding build upon new graces to help us gain wisdom in what we try to uncover so that others can understand the marvels of life, especially the spiritual mystery. Amen. 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 So um, with that, uh, thank you everybody for um, uh, participating. And uh, the questions that are in the chat room that we didn't get to, I'll send to the presenters and uh, we'll try to come up with some responses. Uh, in the meantime, God bless and have a great day.